Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Connor Moran. I'm the director of the Wisconsin Book Festival. Thank you so much for joining us here tonight for writing into Inhospitable Space um, with UW professors Heather Swan and Shereen Sherrard. We are absolutely de delighted to be hosting both of these wonderful authors um, for such an important topic. Um, Shireen and Heather also both have books out right now. Um, you may have seen in the New York Times Book Review, Shireen Sherrard's book Grimoire was just recognized as new and noteworthy poetry. Um, and we're also delighted to be hosting Heather Swan for A Kinship with Ash. Um, two wonderful books by university professors here in Wisconsin. And that is um, one of the most wonderful things that I get to do in my role as director is highlight great work being done um, by Wisconsinites here in Wisconsin, here at the university, here in Madison. So um, thank you both for being here. Um, it's really a pleasure to have you. Um, before we get started, I do want to thank Madison Public Library and the Madison Public Library Foundation um, for eight years, but particularly during this pandemic, they have been unwavering supporters of free cultural events um, here in Madison. Um, that has never wavered and has been incredible for the last seven months, um, bringing authors like Shireen and Heather, Nikki Giovanni, um, sorry, uh, Salman Rushdie, tonight's other events with Jacob Tobia, Edward Ball, and Robert P. Jones, and all eight events that we have tomorrow. So thank you to them and thank you to all of our sponsors um, for their work in making this event possible. Uh, but it really wouldn't be possible without the work of these great authors. I will turn um, the microphone and camera over to them. Thank you so much um, to both of you for being here um, and I will see you at the end. Thanks. Thanks, Connor. Um, and thank you to everyone for joining us here. When um, Heather and I thought about this event, we certainly were imagining being in community with you in person, but um, things as such as they are, um, in some ways, this allows us to um, stretch that community in ways we didn't anticipate. And so we'll, we'll take it. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit before we get started with the reading about the program. Um, the description that many of you read when we looked back at it is pretty ambitious in terms of what we wanted to do. Um, but just so you know what to expect, we are going to begin with a reading. So we're going to do a short reading, um, but then we will focus on the primary topic of the program, which is how um, institutionalized racism and environmental justice fit together and how we can address them in poetry. Um, in our poetry, but also as we'll do um, later in the program through a interactive communal poem that we hope you will contribute to and that we can write together. Heather, did you wanna say a little bit about uh, what the poem will involve so people can prepare? Yeah, maybe just as we're going through the, um, the reading, you can think about your own ideas about what a hospitable space looks like. And so at the end of um, our conversation, then we'd love to hear what it means to all of you. And we'll, we'll design uh, this little project that will allow you to have an image that will contribute to this larger poem that we'll create together. That's perfect, thanks. We really did see this as interactive um, and we do see our poems as um, being in conversation, at least in the, the the structure of the reading together. And so we are going to, in our reading, go back and forth, um, but I'm gonna start. So I'll read um, first a couple of poems um, from Grimoire. So here it is, um, my, my new book. Um, I should say that the poems in Grimoire respond to, engage with, um, evolve out of uh, my reading of the first cookbook by an African-American woman. Um, it was called, or it is called a domestic cookbook. Um, um, penned by Mrs. Melinda Russell in 1866. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the poems, at least in the first section, um, take the form of recipes. Um, sometimes they just take an ingredient. Um, other times there's actually words or language from the actual cookbook in the poem. So you might hear some of that and I'll talk a little bit about those poems and also talk about the, the second portion as well. So the first poem I'm going to read is a recipe poem. Um, and again, it does have um, found language from the cookbook. Marble cake, the white. My son, half cup white flour, quarter cup brown sugar, has trouble with fractions. When pregnant, I did not follow instructions, 
beat the yolks and sugar together until very light. It was months before I accepted I was carrying another human being. Add half pound butter, whip 14 egg whites, flavor with lemon, half gill brandy. The dark. The ophthalmologist suspects he's colorblind, half cup molasses, the yolks of eight eggs. Perhaps that's why he prefers brown sugar in his oatmeal. He can't tell how it's different from white. Flavor with cinnamon, cloves, nutmeg, or mace. I confess, I palmed the iron pills, drank light rose brews without sugar or cream. Mixed children usually come out beautifully. The doctor is unsure about mine. Paper and butter the pan. First a layer of the white, then of the dark alternatively finishing with the white. So the first section, as I said, engages with these recipes in various ways, um, but the second section deals with another kind of making. In particular, it focuses and thinks about health disparities um, among women of color, between white women and women of color around issues of childbirth and child rearing. And probably we'll talk more about that later in the program. Um, and so this next poem, which begins the second section, um, deals with those themes and definitely interconnects them with some of the earlier sections of the book. Outcome. Her serve is 125 miles an hour, but she cannot outrun this. She has won, has published, but she cannot outwrite this. She has starred, has danced, but she cannot out twirl this. She has flown, sung, and swam, released from parallel bars, stuck a vault without stutter, but always the eclipse awaits. Anomaly, when a thing happens that the accumulated data cannot validate. You tell yourself, this is not life-threatening. You tell yourself, you can afford to raise or bluff. You tell yourself, you can enunciate yourselves out. The talented tenth assembles a league of doulas. They edge the black of their capes with starlight. None of this helps. None of this will save you. I just, I'm so, I'm always just, every time I hear that poem, I just am so struck by the power of it um, and the importance, Shereen. So thank you for reading it. And um, thank you, Connor, and thank you, uh, Book Festival. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, and I'm really grateful to be working with Shireen. Um, so when we started talking about these books and our, our sort of our overlaps and also our, our concerns, I think that both of us were thinking that these poems that we've been writing are sort of, um, sort of an act of, of trying to survive. And so thinking of these books as sort of like survival guides uh, two of the really large issues that our, um, our world faces is our, our institutional racism and environmental destruction. And so we will be looking at how those overlap. My own book um, starts with uh, a lot of the poems really engage um, the devastations that are, are occurring on the planet, but also uh, are invested in trying to build uh, resilience through uh, remembering beauty and, um, and also uh, finding empathy, building kinship. So uh, the first poem in the book, I'll just read, um, is called Directive. <clears throat> in this world of waters, the unleashed waters, we wend our way, not heeding the beacons while the snow geese wait for ice that never arrives. And the swans move southward, but parry. Who designed our faulty compass? We must stop now and scrape the soil clear of plastic shards and dead grass, and with our fingernails etch a new map, born of bone, aware of our kinship with ash, with crickets, with wrens. Uh, unlike Shireen, I don't have um, nice recipes in um, my book. I do have um, a series of poems that are based on Pesticides, um, just kind of you know going the other direction. Uh, the thing is, I discovered that pesticide uh, companies had used words like vespers and victor and 
serenade uh, for the names of, so brand names of pesticides. And when I learned this, I was so upset by that, that I decided that I would try to take those back. And so I have written a series of pesticide poems that, um, that hopefully are, are reclaiming uh, those words. So the first one is called Pesticide One, Liberty. Remember how we ran through the fields of Queen Anne's lace, shirtless, our sex still knotted like tiny fists in our chests, jeans rolled up to the knees, and how our ankles were crusted with mud from the creek where we caught frogs and crawdads for sport and let them go. Remember eating ground cherries and wild raspberries, sucking the sweet from red clover, and the clouds of yellow sulfur wings rising around us on days after rain when they gathered on the drying puddles in the road. And the neighbor's farm, where we raced through the halls of corn, risking being sliced by the menacing green knives, stealing when we were hungry, tearing an ear open and plunging our teeth into the firm inviting flesh, the dirt mixed with sweat. Remember when we thought what we should fear was the bull, we outran and the nettles and the ticks before our bodies betrayed us, before we knew we were doomed all along, before we learned of the real poisons lurking all around us, before I started having nightmares and you started carrying a gun. That's Heather. As Heather said, uh, both of our poems do circle around different kinds of precarity. Let's see. Open curtains. If it is barely spring, orange tulips frame my neighbor's bungalow, a roguish backdrop for the boys' white sneakers, black and yellow hoodies. They are up to nothing or something. I am listening to their buzzing, but not hearing. I am thinking of my boy on a parallel street in like formation, not regarded by me. I read the same page over and over until when I look up, they are gone. The bruised shadows of tulips loiter in their wake. The next poem I'm going to read is one I wrote um, in the wake of the 2016 election. Um, and it's partly in response to the conversations that I had um, following the election um, with people who would just sort of spontaneously burst into tears um, when talking to me about it. And I found myself to be just really empty and dry eyed. And I just didn't have a response um, for them um, because for me, it, it wasn't entirely um, unexpected. Apologia. Today in the mail, I received a handwritten note from a person whose illegible signature required that I Google the address to discover its provenance. Let me restate, its provenance was benevolent privilege. So accustomed am I to the casual pokes and missteps of daily interaction that I failed to be offended by or maybe misremembered the incident obligingly related inside the card imprinted with an abstract collage of what I think was an Asian carp, an invasive species my son likes to fish for in the lake and let suffocate on shore. He lures them with sweet corn, a kindness, he says, because these carp have no restraint. They obliterate biodiversity, and we do not want a lake that holds only one type of fish. Thank you, Shereen. So powerful. Uh, so one of the, the things that Shereen and I have in common is that we both are the mothers of boy children. And, um, and and I, we both think about what it means to be growing up in this culture, of course. Um, in this case, I'm thinking about uh, masculinity and what, what shape that has had. Uh, and this is a response to that. Boy, he burst from the cattails clutching a bullfrog, the glabrous body slick with mud, thick legs outstretched, but somehow tranquil. His hands could easily crush this creature whose soft belly is the color of milk, who can breathe through her skin, whose only protections are a transparent eyelid and quickness. 
This is the child who, in the darkness, unable to sleep, curls into the body he came from and asks, but who invented war? And can a bullet go through brick? Can a bullet go through steel? Now, at the water's edge, filled with a wild holiness, he navigates the balance and lets the frog go. Um, I'm going to read a second pesticide poem. Uh, some of you may know that I have um, been a beekeeper in the past. And um, so one of the things I think about often are insects. This, this is about some of my bees. Pesticide seven, Victor. The handfuls of dead bees she finds after the spraying are not the worst part for the beekeeper. It's the bees still struggling that gets to her, limping in a circle like someone who's been spinning on a tire swing for too long, who then stands dizzy, nauseous, stunned. Their wings shudder, but they cannot fly. These insects whose bodies know the rhythm of the blossoms, the changing angles of the sun, whose alchemy gives us liquid gold, whose love affairs with pistols and stamens give us apricots, almonds, melons. To witness is to be dredged, she thinks. What war do we think we're winning? Together. So um, the next poem I'm going to read is called Red Tide. And so here in Wisconsin, usually around late summer, there's this effect that happens to the lakes where like blue green algae starts to bloom and the lakes are closed and we can't go in them and it can be really deadly um, to humans, but especially to dogs. Um, so a red tide is similar in that it's an algae bloom, but it happens in a, a different locale and it is connected to global warming and runoff. Um, but the place where I've seen it most is um, on Long Island. Um, and there's a place on Long Island, which um, is in my family that we often go in the summer. Sadly, not this summer, um, we didn't travel, but this is the place where I've seen, um, I've seen the red tide and it, it literally, the water looks like blood. Red tide. We wade into a channel sluggish with pink foam like a tube of tomato paste has been squeezed into the simmering salt bath surrounding the sandbar. There is no ferry or ferryman to bribe for passage. Stirred by offshore storms, the organic shedding leaves behind a wake of death, wakes death, fish do not wake. They float capsized until low tide maroons them on the sandy mound where prenatal yoga was held yesterday. Another wave of cramps rips through my abdomen. This is not a normal flow. It's gravity, invisible, insistent. My link with the moon has been broken as if it is the fault of the lunar cycle. What lunacy there is in that expression. As I wait for the lift that will take us to triage, a crimson fringe halos the moon. Viewed from the rear view mirror, it is an orange marble. Omen obsessed, I ask the driver, do you see that blood on the moon? And she says, no, that is Mars. So I didn't say this at the beginning, but the title for Grimoire is actually comes from a magical textbook, kind of like the books of power that alchemists used. Um, when the lines between magic and science and cooking were actually quite blurred. Um, and so several of the recipes in the cookbook that I was drawing from are actually called receipts. So it's the idea of, a, of an earlier version of that. And just like some of this um, poems in here are recipes, they're also spells. And I think that goes back to this idea um, that Heather and I have about uh, ways in which our books do act as survival guides. And I don't think that we are offering necessarily the answers, but just pointing to the kinds of things that sustain us. Um, so I'm gonna read this next poem, which I think falls more in that category of a spell poem in certain ways. Oracle at Venice Beach, 1995. Seeking an ancestral cipher against the grim statistics of racial math we bypass the palm reader seated under the adjacent tent. I want to say that her dreadlocks 
studded with the cowrie she would cast for us, brush the ground like a cape. She knew your baby brother would turn vegan than baker, that I would travel to a colder coast and be caught between two men. One would take my virginity and the other would be my ride or die, but only if I kept quiet and discern the one to love from the one to leave. There must have been more mundane news, birth or death, money and romance, the predictable tides of life. I forgot until you told me, we hadn't spoken for a year, that it was aggressive and genetic, that she had warned you of female trouble, to not wait if you wanted offspring. Now, in the undercommons between girlhood and matronage, I absorb her patois, sense the calories warming in my fist. She refused our money. She was not wrong. What else, remember, did she say? Thank you, Shireen. Um, this poem uh, is also a bit like a spell, in my opinion. Um, it's all, it's actually about, uh, to go back to Shireen's comment about the red tide, it's actually about blue green algae bloom and um, so also a toxic uh, event that happens um, and affects uh, all kinds of things, uh, humans, but um, many non-humans as well. It's called an incantation to be spoken lakeside. And, I, and I'll say that it was, I, I was asked to do it uh, for the Dane County Water Commission in response to this uh, show that they were doing where they were pairing artists and poets. And I was assigned Thompson's Algae Bloom on Fish Lake. An incantation to be spoken lakeside. The way it defies gravity, always invisibly rising. The way its white breath floats high above, the way it holds the sky up to itself, reflecting the light, the blue, and the way it doubles the birds passing through, the way it trembles at the, at the wind's caress, the way it always responds, the way it circles our oars, our limbs, the embrace of the unconditional, the way it allows the bodies of fish, the bodies of frogs, the tiny blue-green algae bodies, the way it offers itself to the thirsty and takes whatever comes, the way it reflects our faces, reflects the things we love, the love we have for perfect lawns, the perfect green of perfect lawns, the phosphorus we pour and pour, the way it opens to whatever comes, to what comes pouring off our streets, the way it swallows whatever comes, the swirl of green grows and grows, a floating raft of poison, the way it does not protest even when it's choking, the way it does not discriminate or warn, the way it offers itself to the mouths of the animals who come in darkness, not knowing how toxic the green, the deadly perfect lawn green, the way it will hold the bodies of dogs and the bodies of cows when they weaken and when they begin to twitch and when they begin to stiffen and the way it will carry them after. So that's a pretty dark uh, uh, poem, but um, I wanted it to uh, hopefully change a person's mind about the importance of water when they heard it. Um, not all of the poems in the book are quite as dark, and I wanted to read a poem that was more about um, the healing that I think we all need to have as a society. And so this next poem is called How to Love the Damaged Ones. See how the body of the horse flinches when she startles, how her flesh flickers, haunch rippling like soil in a quake, hooves pawing the ground as if trying to move backward in time, eyes wide, neck arching back to see more of what might bite or bruise her. Not because you mean to harm her, but memory drives her reflexes and adrenaline spikes clutch the brain. Don't give up. Lean in, only when your hand and your voice become as common as breath and as kind will her heart beat slow, will her face soften, and you will be surprised by how far she can run and what she'll be willing to carry. Thank you. So Maybe now is the time that we could have a few questions, do you think, Shireen, from the audience, if anyone has any questions about the poems before we go on to, to talk a little bit about the intersection of 
of institutional racism and environmental issues? These are the moments when I wish we were all in a room together. <laughs> we could look around, smile at some folks. Okay. So one of the questions is, might inhospitable, inhospitable places include one's own self-defeating defeating headspace? Do you want to take that, Shereen? <laughs> I'm thinking about that. Um, okay. Sure, <laughs> I think so, right? Especially if you feel like you're being caught in a loop, right? And I think that's something that, um, or the, you're receiving messages that are just reinforcing um, the same um, the same ideology, which in many ways is, is part of why we can't communicate. Uh, right now, politically or, or otherwise, in certain ways, um, but I also think it could also apply to um, concerns around mental health as well. Mm -hmm. I don't know. What do you think, Heather? Uh, yeah, and I think that one of the things that's that's hard um, right now is that it it sometimes feels so apocalyptic that I think that that defeatist um, uh, sort of loop that you're talking about uh, can be partly, what could I possibly do to make anything better? Uh, and so there's that, I feel like there's a, a fatigue actually um, that would, yeah, that I think that when you are feeling hopeless about uh, change, it's easy to also feel hopeless about your own life. Um, but I think that Shireen's right, that, that, um, that certainly mental health would, be, would, be, would fall into that category. Mm -hmm. Heather, so much of poetry has historically centered on the natural world. How do you feel like your work subverts those tropes? How do you feel it supports them? Um, thank you for that question. I feel like uh, I just heard someone the other day talking about um, whether or not, and it was sort of this, uh, just as an, an example, but is there still, you know, is, it, is there still space for the tree poem? Uh, and I, and I think that what they meant by that was the sort of um, the romantic, um, the romanticization of, of the natural world. Uh, and I guess what I'll say is that I feel like absolutely there's space for that, that work. And, uh, and I feel like a, a lot of the, you know, like a pastoral or something like that um, offers all kinds of things. The thing that I would say that my work does, I hope, is that it's, it acknowledges um, the elegy that is really pervasive right now. For me, it seems like there, we're, when I think about any species like an insect or a, uh, or a bird, uh, many of which have gone extinct, I, I think of, of the experience of thinking of them or writing about them as elegy uh, and I feel like I want to uh, name the problems, uh, mourn the losses, and also invite us to connect so that we can change our patterns. So I hope that that's what the poetry is doing, but someone would have to tell me after they read the book if they thought it was actually successful. I think so, I think so anyway. <laughs> Thank you. So there's another poem, another uh, question here that's about writing. Um, do you write poems on the computer, on the phone, by hand, and does the method change the result? Um, so I write poems out longhand. Generally, I have a journal that I try and use for that. But you know, if I need to, I'll use whatever paper is at hand. Um, the only time I would say that's different is if I'm out on a walk or I'm somewhere where I have no paper, and then I'll record my thoughts on the phone. That's the only other time I use the phone, but it's not really a method for me. It's more of like a, in a pinch, um, a, 
kind of technology that I'll use. Um, and then I edit on the screen. So it's usually once I feel like the poem has taken a certain shape or it's, I have a sense of where it's going, then I'll, I'll um, type it up. And then as a next stage, I'll print it out and then start doing my editing that way. Mm -hmm. so, then that's in Bolt's question. Um, yeah, and I don't, I mean, that's just my process. I'm not sure that it changes the result. It might. Um, I, I also write uh, in notebooks, um, but I, I find that, that working on the computer too has a different, uh, what happens then is that I think more about form and a lot of times the, the initial um, ideas come to me on paper and then I, so I also move to, to do the editing. So I think maybe our, our process is pretty similar, Shereen. Yeah. Oh, here's a one for me. I like when they have, you know, it's hard to say, what is it for me? Is it for you? Is it for both yeah. of us? Okay. So I think that one we just did was for both of us, but this yeah. one's for me. Um, mm -hmm. About talking about the cookbook and what I learned about the author and the process. Um, so I came about across the cookbook in um, a book called The Jemima Code by Tony Tipton Martin, which was basically a compendium of black culinary history. And this, because it's the earliest, there were pages from Melinda Russell's cookbook, just one or two pages that she had excised there. And I was just um, captivated by the voice of the writing um, in the recipes, um, as well as the author's preface. Um, she was a free woman of color who had a pastry shop in Tennessee, um, you know, and before the Civil War. So she was running this business. And I just felt like there were things in that cookbook that countervened the, the, um, the assumptions we make about Black life, um, both free back Black life as well as enslaved Black life in the 19th century. Um, so I did some more research um, to using the cookbook in some ways as a cipher. I was able to get a facsimile of the cookbook itself from the University of Michigan. They're called, I asked them, I said, can you send this to me? And they, they sent me um, a facsimile of the entire cookbook. And I used that um, to try and dig up more on the author, but really beyond the cookbook, there isn't much. And so I ended up really using the recipes as a way of trying to understand some kind of emotional truth, if not a factual um, biography, because that remained elusive. So for me, um, both reading the recipes very closely and actually cooking some of the recipes, um, that was part of the, the impetus and that that's part of what led to the book itself. Okay, we're getting the sign that we've kind of reached our question, um, our, our time. Um, so before we talk about the communal poem, I think um, there were a couple of things that Heather and I wanted to say about just how we see um, the topics of racial justice and environmental justice connecting um, certain ways. Um, I think we've tried to show that through our reading, but I, we were going to, we just have a few um, ideas that we wanted to share and then um, set up the poem. So, one, yeah, one of the things that um, I think that is actually it's sort of um, sort of a flawed way of thinking about um, the reality that we have is that you can sort of pull apart these issues of environmental justice and institutional racism, and in fact, they're very much um, connected. And um, so, one of the things that I thought about when Shreen and I were talking, I was thinking about how when we think about climate change, we often talk about the whole globe um, being affected by these issues. But in fact, um, you know, the global South will experience the devastations of this much more um, keenly than the, the global North, um, in part because of water shortages, droughts, economic differences, um, the kinds of mobility um, that exist or don't exist in those two different places. And so, so very um, broadly, I think thinking about how um, not everyone will experience climate change in the same way is, is one thing to, to consider. In the United States alone, um, there have been many studies that have shown that, um, that African-Americans are going to experience issues of environmental devastation much more than 
non-African-American. So three times, um, the, an African-American is three times more likely to die from exposure to toxicity from environmental waste because they often live closer to industrial sites, uh, dumps, um, and landfills. And so these things will pollute the, the water, the air. Um, I know that uh, the people who have problems with uh, pollutants in the air, I think that African-Americans suffer lung disease and heart disease by 1.5 um, times as much. Uh, it, they, have, they have these, these effects 1.5 1, 1 times as much as the, um, as the white population. And, and so when I think about you know, these issues of clean air and clean water, of course, that also has to do with, um, you know, who's, who is being affected by these things. Um, and I, the other thing I just want to say quickly before um, Shereen adds to this is that one of the things that we talked about too in this, in thinking about this reading was how um, so much of the discourse right now is, is antagonistic and separate. And so one of the things that we really wanted to do in thinking about hospitable space was to build kinships. And, um, and so part of the reason that we're even doing this back and forth is to show that we can have collaboration, you know, that we can be working on these things and thinking about these things together. Um, and that's why we wanna have all of you get involved in this poem. Um, and Shireen has in her book some really incredible, um, statistics about even furthering the, the information about environmental um, toxicity. Do you want to share that, Shireen? Yeah, I can talk about them. I mean, I think with uh, what I'm focused on is a, a much more um, intimate ways in which the environment um, can affect um, especially women of color and um, in such a way that the environment can make the womb itself an inhospitable space. Um, the epigraph to the second section of my book um, I, I think I'll actually just read it because it was uh, very powerful for me when I came across this article in the New York Times written by Linda um, Villarosa. And I'll just read this brief quote. Black infants in America are now more than twice as likely to die as white infants, 11.3 per 1,000 black babies compared with 4.9 per 1,000 white babies, according to the most recent government data a racial disparity that is actually wider than in 1850, 15 years before the end of slavery, when most black women were considered chattel. So the idea that a woman, a black woman would have a better um, birth outcome when she was enslaved than now to me was just stunning. And it was um, partly, I think, a motivator for how I began to see the, the second section of the book, but it also, um, calls or just draws very clearly to me that these issues around environment um, and really the toxicity of racism, right, is literally, it is itself like an environmental danger, right? And I think the events of the spring have drawn that out um, even more, um, even more closely. Um, that said, and I, again, in some of these statistics, whenever you begin to use these statistics, they sound grim, there are mitigating factors. And in some of the research I did around birth outcomes here in Madison, um, there's a group of doulas who are birth coaches and they're black women who, um, women of color who support the birth process and the labor process for women of color. And it, the data shows that having um, a support person who really sees you as a human being and is very much invested in your welfare um, can change those birth outcomes. So there are things that can be done um, to mitigate um, circumstances. And I think the collaboration we're speaking to is a part of it. So do we want to talk about the poem? Sure. <laughs> Lots of people have been getting prepared. Yeah. Uh, so we have an idea and we, we've never done this before. So it, I hope it works. Um, but what we would like to do is have everybody take a moment to think about what their vision of a hospitable space looks like. And so we were hoping that everyone could fill in uh, the sentence, either a hospitable space looks like, or a, hospital, a hospitable space is. And then you can fill in something like, um, you know, uh, an open hand, uh, 
a seat at the table, um, a clean lake, um, whatever it is that you're envisioning that a hospitable space would mean, um, if you can write it in the chat, then we are going to receive all of those and we will read them all together and they will be a poem about what this community thinks about hospitable space. Mm -hmm. So we'll give you about two minutes, three minutes. Okay. I think so, see what comes. Yeah. Yeah, so just think. Don't worry too much. <laughs> We're not expecting, you know, anything Pulitzer Prize winning. We just want, you know, your, your gut response. Now's kind of when you want to hear that Jeopardy music and hope that it's <laughs> encouraging. <laughs> That's the cute music. Um, why? Why Jeopardy? That is exactly what came into my mind. I know. That's, I just felt like that, you know, as a teacher, you know, I think both of us, even on Zoom, this is the experience we have when we're just waiting, you know, hoping. Yeah. Um, just really just anything that people, that comes to mind, just how you would finish that. A hospitable space looks like. Yeah. And it is. You're doing great. Trust your trust your instincts. Okay, some are coming. It's gonna be anonymous. It's just gonna like, we're just gonna um because we can't see your chat, so Connor's passing them on. Okay, maybe we could start reading them, Shireen, and how about I read one and then you read one and so that yeah. we can have a little space between the voices? Sure, yeah. And yeah, and keep if people more common to add them in. They come in. So um, here's our poem, everyone, called um, a Hospitable Space. A hospitable space is where we are undefensive about past injustice able to acknowledge and move forward to make things better. An hospitable space is where you're safe enough to feel comfortable being vulnerable and joyful. A hospitable space is a walk at night with no fear. An hospitable space is a mossy nook. A hospitable space is where I can be myself and not second guess me or you. A hospitable space is a sincere, welcoming smile or greeting. A hospitable space is a landmark crushing down with collateral, collateral like wasted fence lines, mythological urns that never existed. Now we see the rustic used, used tables, the road signs and targets. We feel guilty for burying them. An hospitable space looks like real, honest, true smiles. A hospitable space is curled into a warm belly. A hospitable space would be comfortable, warm, and welcoming. Thanks everyone. I know it's really um, vulnerable to share your words in public and especially when you're just saying them into a void. <laughs> Um, so we really appreciate that. And um, yeah, that's just, I just feel really enriched by um, people's willingness to share and the courage to share their words. In that way. Very beautiful. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah.
So where we, we're going to close with, um, I think, a poem. Each of us is going to read a poem, right? Oh, a couple more. Last one, uh, hospitable space is being open-minded, definitely. <laughs> oh, there are more. Okay, maybe, should we wait a second? Maybe a hospitable space is the stone shell of the Renwick smallpox hospital encased in ivy, home to a symphony of birds and a strong feral cat colony. Wow. Really? Amazing. <laughs> I forgot there is that delay, right? So we might have to wait. Ah. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for contributing those lines. I think that we can all think about this as we go out into our evenings, I hope. Um, so yeah, we are going to just close with a couple of poems. Shreen, would you like to, to share? Um, yes, sure. Um, I think the poem I want to end on is a poem called Weathering, uh, which I haven't read before. Um, and the title comes from a concept um, by um, a concept that comes from a public health um, doctor. Her name is Arlene Geronimus. And weathering is her theory, which she later proved, which is about how trauma is passed down. And we often think about that in terms of stories and families and, and a psychological way. But she actually did research to show that um, the trauma that's experienced and can actually change your DNA and be passed on through um, the DNA of the next generation. Um, and she calls that weathering. I'm not a scientist, so, you know, <laughs> I'm playing fast and loose here with some of this, and that's why I'm trying to give you the names, but the title of this poem is Weathering. None of us in the prenatal clinic are the right age. We are climbing or descending the bell curve. The 18 to 35 year olds are still at happy hour. They spend their petty cash on pedicures. Think of your shoelace, the genetic counselor says benignly. The plastic tip that keeps the cotton from unraveling, that's the telomere. It protects your legacy. In your people, it has come off, peeled away like a chimney from an F4 twister by a toxicity that seeps and creeps until your womb is all black mold in need of remediation. All you glean from this prognosis. Please strap yourself into the stirrups. An audience of white coats anticipates. This science is for saving lives that matter, not salvaging slaves. A nurse secures the shackles as the surgeon shifts your paper gown to expose one breast. He whispers what Cassiopeia must have said to sturdy Andromeda before leaving her for the Kraken. Be not afeard, after this, list, after this last trial, you will be magnified, astral, a consolation. Thank you, Shireen. It's, it's, Shireen's book is so good, please buy it. It's really, really amazing. It's so important to read it right now. <laughs> it's such a good book. Anyway, uh, so I, it's, one of the things that I, this, I'm also writing about, um, about mothering. This piece is actually written for my mother, who's a, who's a potter. She makes pottery. And, uh, and one of the things that we learned from her uh, was this, was this lesson um, about how things weren't always going to be easy. And sometimes um, <laughs> she always used to say it was, you're building your character. This is character building right now. Um, anyway, this is from a mother. It's called Bowl. From the mud in her hands, the bowl was born. Opening like a flower in an arch of petals, it became a vessel both empty and full. Later in the kiln, it was ravaged by fire, its surface etched and vitrified, searing the glaze into glass as its body turned to stone. It is at the edge of damage that beauty is honed. And in Japan, the potter tells me, when a tea bowl cracks in the fire, 
That crack is filled with gold. So glad you read that one. <laughs> I, that's my favorite poem, actually. Oh, okay. oh good. Perfect to end on. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Shireen. And thank you, Connor. And thank you all for being here. I'm so grateful that we had this time together. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Well, Heather and Shireen, thank you so very much. Um, what a wonderful reading and what an incredible um, and creative way to um, bring the audience into a virtual event. Um, it, you said it was a first for you, but it's definitely um, a first for me and for the Wisconsin Book Festival as well. Um, we did get a couple of extra um, hospitable places. So I'm wondering if I could put those in the chat and if you'd read those last couple um, for, the, for these people. Does that work for you? Sure. Yeah, okay. go ahead. Great. All right. So I, I started I started doing that, and I'll grab the last two. An hospitable space is the smell of orange and bergamot tied together to bring out the moss shine. A hospitable space is one where we see ourselves as earthlings united for our mutual well-being. Wonderful. I think that's a really great place to leave it. Thank you, Shireen. Thank you, Heather. Um, mm -hmm. This was very special um, and really a great, um, a great message for everyone and something that um, I think that we don't talk about often enough. So thank you all. Thank you so much for being here tonight. We have two more events tonight. Edward Ball and Robert P. Jones for Life of a Klansman and White Too Long um, starts at 7. Um, and then Jacob Tobia will be here for their memoir, Sissy, at 8.30. Thank you so much, everyone, and we hope that you have a great night. Thanks. Thank you.